This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, broadcasting from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. If you are joining us on YouTube, you should know that this program is also available on your favorite podcast platform. This talk is with Darren Freeberry Jones, lecturer in Shakespeare Studies at the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust in Stratford-upon-Avon. We will take a look at two of Darren's very recent books on Shakespearean contemporaries. The first is Reading Robert Green, Recovering Shakespeare's Rival. The second is Shakespeare's Tudor, The Influence of Thomas Kidd. We will also talk about Darren's role at the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust and his work as an actor and creative writer. This series is funded with support from the Aoyama Gakuin University Institute of the Humanities, and also with a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Uh, Darren, welcome to our little program here. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me, Tom. It's an absolute pleasure and privilege. It's a pleasure and privilege for me, too. However, I have just gotten through two books that you have written. God, <laughs> damn you. <laughs> we have <laughs> they are exquisite books, but they both came out uh very recently in 2022 oh. publications. And one is on Robert Green, one is on Thomas Kidd. Both are on pre pre-Shakespearean or how we think of pre-Shakespearean uh playwrights or playwrights who were very active at the time that Shakespeare was working in London. We know that, but pro but predated him in terms of their playwriting. And, and particularly in the case of Thomas Kidd may have had a, a huge influence on Shakespeare. I mean, they're all living in this, let's face it, a fairly small area. But oh, I gosh. wanted to talk first is reading Robert Greene, uh, recovering Shakespeare's rival and Shakespeare's tutor the influence of Thomas Kidd, both fascinating uh, topics. Let's let's begin with Robert Greene and then and kind of try to segue into uh, Thomas Kidd, if we could. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, so it's funny with uh, Monograph, you spend a long time waiting for the green lights and uh, got two acceptances in the space of a, a week. I had waited quite a long time for, for the green light with the Thomas Kidd book. Um, so I was working on proofs and indexing and whatnot uh, concurrently uh, with, with those two books. But I, I think my interest in Robert Greene probably began around 2016, where I was taking part in a, a reading session and we were reading Alphonsus, King of Aragon, uh, Greene's probably first uh, dramatic effort. And I, I turned to everyone in the room and I said, you know, is there is there a collected or, or complete works edition of Green? And uh, I, I discovered that there hadn't been one uh, for over a century. And I thought, you know, there's a significant gap in the market, <laughs> uh, yes. but also in our knowledge when it comes to Robert Green, because his his uh, sort of critical background, I think, has been very negative because of that diatribe aimed at Shakespeare in, in the pamphlet uh, Green's Groat's Worth of Wit. So his influence on Shakespeare has often been framed in, in malignant terms. But I think Green is absolutely crucial for our understanding of the evolution of commercial drama, because he's often seen as something of a slavish imitator. But for me, he always had a finger on the popular pulse of the time. And his dramas are actually quite tremendous. You know, they're, they're highly entertaining. Thinking of Alphonsus, King of Aragon, you've got a wooing scene in a battlefield. You've yeah. got a play bristling with intrigue, disguise, deception. And his dramas are also visually stunning. You think of Venus ascending and descending in that play, or a brazen head belching forth flames of fire. So I, I think Green is a, is a really tremendous dramatist. And while I was waiting for the, the Thomas Kidd book to, to get accepted, I, I thought, you know what, rather than twiddling my thumbs, I, I, I'll work on another book. And for me, it was a real learning experience. That's the joy of, of research and writing for me, is that you're learning. And of course, you're hoping that your readers will learn as well. 
So I, I wrote it in, in around six months, largely in the evenings, extracurricular work outside of my job uh, and, you know, with a partner and, and, and children. So very much <laughs> uh, did this research by candlelight. And it, it was just fabulous, really engaging with not only green stromatic cannon and, and testing the, the limitations of that, but also discovering the impact that he had on other playing repertoires and, and other dramatists of the period. So we, we often think of Green as something of a hack writer, you know, you know trying to keep the, the wolf away from the door, when in reality, he was one of the leading dramatists, if not the leading dramatist for the Queen's Men, you know, the dominant acting company yeah. of the 1580s. And, and what I discovered during the course of writing this book was that he exerted a, a, a huge influence on other plays of the period, particularly the company Lord Strange's men, who often sought to duplicate aspects of his play, thinking about drama as this commercial operation, an intensely competitive, uh, but also very collaborative period, I think. So yeah, I, I hope to some extent I've, I've resurrected the ghost of Robert Greene and, and offered some new perspectives on him. And I'm general editor for the collected works, or collected plays, I should say, of Robert Greene. But I want to place emphasis on Greene as a dramatist. I think there's been a lot of attention paid to him as a prolific pamphleteer. So that's forthcoming with Edinburgh University Press, okay. uh, hopefully around 2028. So I, I guess that feels like the sort of culmination of the story, beginning with that session reading Alphonsus, King of Aragon in Stratford-upon-Avon and, and hopefully bringing Green's plays to a, a broader constituency. Yeah, it, it really is just, uh, it's just time for it. I mean, it's just been too long and I've had the same, you know, we, we, this happens with other playwrights too, where you can't find a good edition or at least a more recent edition of their works uh, what I would like to do is sort of go quickly in the kid and we can go back and forth too, because these things uh, do uh, combine with each other in some way. And I promised you, we wanted to talk a little bit too about the birthplace trust, the Shakespeare birthplace trust, but let's put that back a little bit and let's go into kid and kids relationship with this whole uh, era. I, I'm thinking mid to late eighties, maybe early nineties in there. Yeah. Uh, when Shakespeare and we we date Shakespeare to eight uh, to uh, 1591 maybe but yeah. it's kind of vague exactly when he started but it's pretty clear that these two very prominent playwrights uh, and they did other things too but very prominent playwrights were working ahead of Shakespeare is is that pretty much correct and kid with the Spanish tragedy of course uh, just a uh, just a monumental play that rivals uh, just anything of the entire Shakespeare Marlowe anything that was produced in that era um kid the um and you know tragic early you know untimely death just like Marlowe and Green also. But let's yeah. go into Kid a little bit and the, the Shakespearean elements of Kid. Yeah, so my relationship with Thomas Kidd is, has been going on for many years because my 2016 uh, doctoral thesis at Cardiff University, I was seeking to have a look at the ways in which Shakespeare was influenced by and, and collaborated with what we often term pre-Shakespearean dramatists, but dramatists who, who had crossover with Shakespeare and I, I was reading as, as widely and attentively as possible it's, it's an approach that you know some some scholars in authorship studies might consider quite Victorian but I think it's absolutely crucial and it was wonderful hearing Thomas Kidd's voice for the first time encountering a play such as the Spanish tragedy but also I, I feel hearing his voice in other plays, uh, off, often anonymous plays or, or, or collaborative plays. And then having a look at the sort of academic record and, and discovering that there had been arguments for a much more extensive Thomas Kidd canon going back, you know, to, to the late 19th century, really. So Thomas Kidd is often seen as a tragic writer. You know, you mentioned the Spanish tragedy, that, that's very much his his blockbuster. And as I agree, it's it's a monumental play. You've also got Solomon and Poseida, which is a, a full-length treatment of the play within a play 
at the conclusion of the Spanish tragedy. Mm -hmm. Solomon and Poseidon, I feel, is a play that really deserves a lot more critical attention than it's received so far, and also would make for great drama on the stage. I, I feel it deserves to be performed. So just, just to give some examples of, of kids' innovation, you know, that, that's, that's a tragedy of love. I, I believe it's the first tragedy of love on the commercial stage. So very much anticipating the likes of Romeo and Juliet and Othello. And you've got the lovers, Poseida and Erastus. And then you've got the Turkish Emperor Solomon, who falls in love with Poseida. So he orders Erastus's execution, essentially in order to, to get him out of the way, because he loves Poseida. And Poseidon seeks revenge. Now, this is very daring by Kidd, I think. It's something we also see in the character of Bell Imperia in the Spanish tragedy, mm -hmm. these vengeful female characters. Mm -hmm. And I, I think Kidd really carved out a lot more space for female characters in tragic narratives. And Poseidon exacts her revenge by dressing herself in a man's apparel and engaging in combat with Solomon. And Solomon slays her and then realizes he's just murdered the woman he loves. So he cradles her in his arms and Poseidon asks him to kiss her. And Solomon willingly obliges. And he then discovers that Poseidon has poisoned her lips. And it's a fatal kiss. And it's a brilliant play. And, you know, that, that for me is, is Thomas Kidd in a nutshell, a really innovative dramatist whose dramas tend to revolve around intrigue. And I think Shakespeare, deeply influenced by the Spanish tragedy, perhaps even more influenced by Solomon and Poseidon, I think Solomon and Poseidon are really key to, to understanding the development of Shakespeare's dramaturgy. And then you've also got Thomas Kidd's Cornelia, his last play, which is a, a translation of a French drama uh, by, by Robert Garnier. And that's a, a drama that takes place uh, around the same time as Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. And it's a play that Shakespeare might have gone back to uh, when composing Julius Caesar, uh, particularly in terms of characterization for, for roles such as Brutus and, and Cassius, for instance. Mm. So that's just the, the traditionally accepted Thomas Kidd canon of, of just three uh, dramatic efforts. And, you know, that, that exerted a, a huge influence on Shakespeare, as well as other dramatists. I, I discovered that although Robert Greene had something about a hostile relationship uh, with Thomas Kidd, evidence suggests, he was also deeply influenced by him, frequently riffing off some of the innovations that Kidd presented to the stage. And for me, it's really important to broaden our knowledge of Thomas Kidd because I think Shakespeare had a career-long engagement with Kidd. And as I argue in my book, I think there's some evidence that Shakespeare likely acted in Thomas Kidd's plays and was able to, to utilise his aural understanding in order to draw from Kidd's dramas, particularly at the level of, of language, Shakespeare is something of a magpie, and, and some of his earliest efforts in particular often read like patchworks of the, the dramatic language of the likes of Kidd, uh, Marlowe, George Peel, for instance. So I feel like Shakespeare was, was haunted by Kidd throughout his career. And as his career progressed, I, I get the sense that Shakespeare often looks wistfully to the past for inspiration. And he often goes back two kids and it's it's interesting now that all authorship attribution scholars agree that Shakespeare contributed to the additions to the Spanish tragedy of 1602 which yeah. is wonderful because as you know Tom authorship attribution scholars seldom agree on anything oh. so yeah. well <laughs> I, I wanted to, to maybe let's interject this now because there's the stylometric um the, the digital um methodologies that are coming out uh, I'm, I do digital humanities like you do, but I am not um, I am not up to speed on this on the software, how good it is, how reliable it is. I know that um, uh, what to, to, to quote the Bible that attribution studies can be a deep ditch. You know, you, you might you know, <laughs> you might find yourself falling off the side. Uh, and I've gotten emails where some people are making some 
claims and, and claiming that I had made some claims about Marlow. I have never uh, questioned Marlow's authorship, but the oh. um, but the the thing is, we are getting to the point, and I want to hear you're you're there, kind of on the front, and I want to hear what types of things you think you're able to do in terms, not so much of full authorship, but collaboration. Well, also full authorship or almost full authorship. You know, I don't know. Th these are collaborative enterprises anyway, you know, with actors oh, and so oh, forth. Yeah. But, you know, with this very dominant author to collaboration to what do you see uh, uh, a certain level of trust developing in these uh, digital methods of attribution? Interesting question. Uh, is there a certain level of Trust in digital methods, um, yes and no, really. Uh, for, for me, a lot of my authorship work is based on those fundamental principles of authorial dramatic style. So, so looking at verse habits, looking at uh, vocabulary, looking at the ways in which authors combine words uh, and really delving into parallelism of thought uh, as well as parallelism of language. So, so trying to get insights into an author's thought process. Um, uh, and at the moment, it's, it's a pretty hot topic that, that makes its way into the popular press yeah. when it comes to these, these digital methods. And I think they sound very impressive, digital scholarship. I also think they have the potential to alienate uh, a lot of readers and, and scholars, including yeah. scholars in the humanities. Uh, and that's the big talking point at the moment is, is what methods are reliable? And uh, the, the discourse is shifting towards science and, and calling certain methodologies scientific and, and, and bandying words around like objective. And then you get critiques of those methodologies. And uh, oftentimes I, I think it's revealed that there's a great deal of subjectivity that goes into one, constructing the tests, but, but two, also interpreting the data. So for me, when it comes to digital scholarship, I, I think it's really important. I think there are marvelous advances, but I also really try to anchor my attribution work in sensitive readings of the plays uh, and, and also anchoring these texts in their original theatrical and historical context. For me, it's, it's still fundamental to, to read these plays closely. And I, I would very much, question scholars who dismiss more traditional literary critical approaches as as subjective because yeah. I, I think digital scholarship it, it can aspire to objectivity just like literary analysis but it's still yeah. dependent on a subjective interpretation of the data yeah I'm 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 in digital humanities, but I'm uh, le leaning Darren on this because it, uh, let's say it was the uh, Marlowe's Tamburlaine, which I know way well. Uh, I just have just always felt that there was a strong line there uh, that, uh, you know, John, what the mighty line very mm. much there that is not kid like and but that I yeah. might, if there were something kid-like in there, I could probably feel it at some point, you know, yeah. like when you get into Faustus and the textual problems with Faustus, you, you see the hands of other playwrights and so forth. But um, certainly there's signatures that I have felt. Shakespeare's very complicated because you have 20 years uh, or more, you know, of a developing playwright, there's a distinctive stylistic difference between the Henry the Six plays and what we would consider to be later plays that you can feel it, but you still are feeling a lot of Shakespeare, no matter what. In my yeah. in my feeling, um, however, you have done some attribution on the Henry the Sixth uh, in terms of Kid and establishing a canon for Kid. And I'm interested in hearing about that because this is a little bit, you know, you, you've gone beyond three plays on um, on with your kid canon. I, I attribute Acts two to five of Henry the Sixth, Part One, to Thomas Kidd's uh, minor scenes added by Shakespeare. So for me, the, the, the plays known as Henry Six, Part Two and Three in the first folio, I, I actually think they're entirely Shakespeare. And, you know, there's a big movement at the moment towards seeing Marlowe as a collaborator. And I've got forthcoming work on this. I'm not remotely 
persuaded by those arguments. I actually think stylistically they're quite distinct from Marlowe and unique in, in, in various ways to, to early Shakespeare. But I, I feel if, if we're looking at chronology, particularly the brilliant work of Martin Wiggins, for instance, yeah. then the, these Henry VI plays are uh, Shakespeare's least mature works. And, you know, they, they, they do feel very polyvocal because I, I think Shakespeare is articulating the, the theatrical vernacular of the time, you know, having acted in the plays of, of contemporary dramatists. And I, I theorise that Shakespeare actually writes those two plays as a two-parter, uh, or a two-part story, a bit like the Tamblyn plays for Pembroke's men. Mm-hmm. I think that's most likely the, the company Shakespeare started off with. And just thinking about commercial rivalry, I think in 1592, the following year, uh, Lord Strange's men then produced a play called Harry the Six, mm-hmm. which I, I think is is designed to capitalise on the success of Shakespeare's uh, two-parter. And it, it gets very tricky when you're thinking of textual scholarship and, and theatre history, because when Lord Strange's men disband, you know, some of their books make their way into the company of Lord Chamberlain's men. So for me, I, I feel that after, in or after 1594, Shakespeare actually revises that play, that Harry the Sixth play, in order to link it with his own efforts. And he adds three scenes. So Act Two, Scene Four, the famous Temple Garden scene, very much transforms this play from a pion uh, to Lord Talbot, often considered uh, at least a, a titular ancestor of Ferdinando Stanley, Lord Strange, and very much makes it part of a serial about the Wars of the Roses. And he adds a couple of other scenes as well involving Lord Talbot. I feel he actually rewrites one of Thomas Kidd's scenes, which is the rhyming uh, dialogue between Talbot and his son, John, when they're saying, you know, we must leave the battlefield. No, we must stay here. And you know, it, do- it doesn't end well e- uh-huh. either way. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think it's a, a fascinating play, Harry the Sixth, that when performed at the Rose, I don't think Shakespeare actually had a hand in it whatsoever. I think it was very much pitched uh, as competition. But then Shakespeare transforms this into a serial. And I think there's a good chance that these Henry the Sixth plays, probably in tandem with Richard the Third, were performed for many years after their original composition, uh, thinking of the, the epilogue to Henry V as oft our stage hath shown, for instance. So Shakespeare engaging very closely with, with the work of Thomas Kidd. Act one of Harry the Sixth is often attributed, convincingly, I think, to Thomas Nash. I've not found any evidence of Shakespeare tinkering with Act One. Mm-hmm. It's it's the scenes I attribute to Thomas Kidd that, that he seems to be really delving into and really engaging with Kidd's dramatic voice. So what you have there is is a different model of collaboration. It, it's it's a form of adaptation or revision. But I also argue that Shakespeare and Kidd co-wrote the reign of King Edward III, probably around 1593 potentially for the company Darby's men. So before Shakespeare goes on to join Lord Chamberlain's men. And I I think there's something of an apologist narrative when it comes to Shakespeare in many respects, because scholars are more inclined to see Shakespeare salvaging or improving the work of other playwrights. And and in the case of Henry VI Part One in the folio, I, I think there's very good evidence for that. But when it comes to plays like Titus Andronicus and Edward III, I think what we see there is a a process of simultaneous collaboration. So, you know, one author or maybe the author's getting together, plotting the play, probably in the pub, I imagine, and then going off at the same time and writing their respective stints. So when we're thinking of collaboration, I think Shakespeare engages with Kidd in in many different ways, uh, collaborating directly with him, through that process of simultaneous uh, collaboration, uh, co-authorship, also revising his work, adapting his work. So uh, I think if you're having a look at Shakespeare's dramatic canon, it it owes a a great deal to Thomas Kidd. I actually think if you're looking at that collection of 36 plays, the 1623 first folio, I think Kidd's is the main hand in Henry VI part one. So you've actually got kids writing alongside the, the writing of 
uh, dramatists such as John Fletcher or, or Thomas Middleton, for uh -huh. instance. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, our, uh, people who are listening, viewing or whatnot, you have abundant examples in your book. And as soon as you get into it, uh, sparks start flying. You know, just uh, as we're talking, I'm thinking of poison on the lips. Well, there's Juliet trying to get the poison off Romeo's. There's so much collaboration. You know, in our modern times, and it might be a sort of post-Victorian thing or a post-romantic thing, we think of the solitary author often, uh, his or her study, uh, uh, putting together, um, you know, this work, you know, independent of, uh, of the world in a way, uh, and while engaging in some kind of fictional enterprise. And... We think of the modern film producer, you know, the strong director with the um, guiding the actors through this, um, um, you know, drama, you know, without the director, the actors are, are nothing. Um, the screenwriters are sort of underneath the thumb of the strong director. This I compare much more with musical trends that we've had, you know, when a new technology develops you know, just recording, you know, how we have this boom and all of this innovation and all of these people collaborating. And sometimes you see one guy playing with one band and going off to the other and uh, and everyone trying to outdo, find their audience and outdo each other. There's something more of a similarity, a parallel there in this era than, I, than what we considered to be uh, traditional authorship or a uh, strong directorial um, hand. Mm, yeah. And, and, you know, th thinking of influence as well, I, I think there's still some scholarly reticence to acknowledge the degree to which Shakespeare borrows from other dramatists. And you're know, thinking of that process of simultaneous collaboration right at the start of Shakespeare's career. He's learning from other artists. It's a, it's a, it's a a musical terminology, but I I, th I think we're we're still stuck in this notion of Shakespeare as something of a a patcher up, uh, a tinker of yeah. older plays, improving the work of other dramatists. Whereas actually, I think this is you know, this is Shakespeare's learning journey right from the start of his career, collaborating with other playwrights and being heavily influenced by them, uh, particularly through having acted in many of their plays. I think or at least having such a capacious verbal memory that on his afternoons off, he could go to the theatre. And of course, he's going to be, you know, <laughs> listening out for uh, particular mediums, particular lines, looking at uh, particular tropes. I think Shakespeare, you know, we, we often think about actors remembering lines they've delivered on stage. I think Shakespeare, of all people, he's going to be listening to that drama throughout, during rehearsals, when he's in the tiring areas, backstage. I think Shakespeare really has an acute ear and he's looking at the strengths and limitations of these early dramas and effectively collaborating with these other playwrights through, through uh, I, I guess, articulating their dramatic language, but consistently doing something a little bit different with it. I always think of that famous T.S. Eliot quote about great artists uh, stealing. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think that the idea of theft was the same uh, as no, exactly. in, in our time. I think that, uh, you know, I just remember going way, way before uh, Chaucer apologizing at the beginning, I think of Troilus and Crusade, where he uh, says, this is the original story. I'm not changing it. And of course, he's lying. Uh, he, yeah. he does change it. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, he changes it uh, a bit from Boccaccio. But I think that that was still in play. People uh, were familiar with a lot of these narratives, and they'd read them in histories, and they uh, some of them had yeah. studied them in Latin or whatnot. But uh, a lot of people have read read them in perfectly uh, uh, scripted, you know, uh, print versions of English, uh, um, Arthur Brooks, Romeo and Juliet have been around for yeah. 30 years and uh, uh, Painter's Palace of Pleasure. And you can see yeah. these people just yanking stuff from the pages and saying, yeah. OK, let's dramatize this. And we wanted to look, uh, we want to do something else with it, innovate. But yeah. uh, we want it to look like this narrative. No yeah. problem there. And all yeah. when you get into the minutia of certain stylistic um, habits and so forth. Uh, it's, it's just absolutely fascinating to me to to look at these things. Yeah, that, and that's that's the thing. You see it in the popular press. I think we often 
kind of extract Shakespeare from the period in which he was writing, where you know, the emphasis was not necessarily telling new stories, but telling existing stories in, in new and you know innovative ways, as you say. And I think Shakespeare is a real master of using those literary and theatrical ancestors uh, in order to subvert audience expectations. You think of a play like King Lear, for instance, which consistently has a happy ending. And there's an old King Lear play, which which seems to have been popular, which I attribute to Thomas Kidd, yeah. actually, which, you know, like all of Shakespeare's sources, concludes happily. And I can imagine that that would, that would still be buzzing in audience members' minds when they went to see Shakespeare's tragedy. And they'd be very mindful of that happy restoration with Lear and Cordella, as, she, as she's called in that play, restored to the throne. And Shakespeare just pulls the rug from under his audience's feet and, and gives them the most devastating conclusion to any theatrical or literary work perhaps. Yeah. So I, I, I think Shakespeare a real master of, of subversion, yes. I can't think of a sadder ending, you know. No, I mean, no. I, I, you know, if you go to a Russian novelist or something, I, you know, you can you can get depressing uh, very quick, but just just <laughs> destroying everything, you know, yeah. there is there's just nothing left left standing, and yeah, that would have been a shocker, you know, oh, a narrative yeah. that you were uh, familiar with. Oh, let's go, um, let's go see the happy ending or whatnot, and after all of this tragic stuff. But nope, uh, you don't get it. Yeah. There's a there's a Hamlet question in there too with Kid, and yes. yeah, yeah. If you could refresh us a little bit on the on the Ur Hamlet, uh, oh or, yes. or, yeah, yeah. The, the, I mean, the Ur Hamlet still remains very enigmatical, and you know we only have around one sixth of all plays composed during the early modern periods. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, people often talk about Cardinio, uh, one of Shakespeare's last plays, Lost, Love's Labours 1, ironically seems to have been, you know, <laughs> Love's Labours Lost, it, it, it's lost to us. But it's that Ur Hamlet, that, that's the one I'd love to get my hands on. So oh, yeah. your viewers and listeners could check their attics, check their basements and let me know. You never know what new discoveries they, they might come across. But yeah. I, I, think, I, I think the evidence for... Thomas Kidd's authorship of this older Hamlet play, written in the late 1580s, is, is fairly compelling. So Nash, Nash refers to, to this old play, it seems, in the preface to, to Robert Greene's Menaphon. And he's, he's talking about a writer who is very dependent on Seneca. He actually uses the, the plural. So some people have inferred that he's, he's talking about, a, you know, a, a team of writers. But... Uh, the biographer, kid biographer, Arthur Freeman, um, pointed out that Nash often does that, even if he's got a very specific individual target, he, he'll often use the plural form. So he's, he's speaking about a writer who is very dependent on Seneca. And I, I think Thomas Kidd, it's fair to say, refined Seneca for the commercial stage, very much sees Seneca as his tragic ancestor. Mm -hmm. he's, he also writes of a a, a, a dramatist who who meddled in Italian translations, which is something Kidd did. Uh, he translated Torquato Tasso's Padre de Familia in, in a pamphlet known as The Householder's uh, Philosophy. You've also got that that phrase, the Kid and Aesop, um, which which seems like quite an obvious pun on, on Thomas Kidd's uh, punworthy name. You've also got references to the Spanish tragedy in there, uh, uh, particularly uh, Thomas Kidd thrusting um, Elysium into hell, if I'm remembering correctly, in, in the prologue uh, to the Spanish tragedy. And Nash also says that this, this particular writer is prone to bodge up a blank verse with ifs and ands. Uh, I, I came across a, a, a review recently which said, you know, this this is an evidence for Thomas Kidd's authorship because that was a common phrase. So it occurs in the Spanish tragedy. What villain, ifs and ands, uh, one of the characters says, says. But actually, if you look at, you know, using modern databases, if you look at all examples of that phrase, ifs and ands, it only occurs in the work of one dramatist before Nash's account. And that is Thomas Kidd's The Spanish Tragedy. 
So I think it's not just a case of, you know, punching a phrase into Evo or literature online or whatever and saying, oh, no, dismissing it as, as common. You've got to be sensitive to these things. Have a look at the chronology in which such phrases occur. So I, I think the evidence for for kids' authorship of, of this older Hamlet play, you know, it, it's, it's not definitive. It, it strikes me as, as fairly compelling. And I think you have to do quite a lot of interpretive gymnastics in order to, to claim that you know, this is, is not uh, uh, a fairly solid case for, for kids' authorship. In order to argue, for instance, that you know, Shakespeare might have written Hamlet in the late 1580s. One of the, the key points that Nash makes, I think, is that he says this writer has left the trade of novarent. And Thomas Kidd's father was uh, the writer of the court letter. He was a scrivener, a professional scribe. So it, it's quite, uh, quite likely, I think, that the kid actually followed in his father's footsteps. So mm -hmm. his handwriting has been noticed in two surviving letters is very neat and suggest the training of a professional scribe. So yeah. quite likely that Kidd did indeed uh, uh, partake in the trade of, of Novrint, that he was a scribe, and then turned his hand to writing plays. So, yeah, I, th I think fairly solid case for Kidd's authorship of this lost Hamlet play. And just going back to those additions to the Spanish tragedy, uh, although they were printed in 1602, we, we tend to think that they were written in the late 1590s uh, due to sort of contemporary illusions. They're, they're mocked by mm -hmm. John Marston in his Antonio plays, for instance. Mm -hmm. So I, I think Shakespeare's memory of the Spanish tragedy was very much refreshed as a result of engaging with it so closely in the late 1590s. And it's, it's long been noted that the Spanish tragedy seems to have served as a model for Hamlet. So when you combine that with with this notion that Kidd might also have been responsible for a dramatic version of the Hamlet or, or Amlet, Amleth myth, then you, know, you, you think it, it's, it's feasible that without Kidd, we wouldn't have two of the, the four great tragedies. We, we wouldn't have Hamlet. And if he's responsible for that old King Lear play I mentioned as well, we wouldn't have King Lear. So like I said, I think Thomas Kidd, absolutely crucial to our understanding of of commercial drama of the period, but but also the dramatic trajectory of Shakespeare's career, I think. I I agree, and I it's very difficult uh, because of the number of plays in the Shakespeare canon to draw people away and say, well, let's let's start with 41, 42, 43, 44, wherever you want to start and uh, however you number them. The uh, and I would argue that you know, hey, five or six Shakespeare plays. Let's get a Nash in there. I'm not a Nash. I'm sorry. Get a Green in there. Get a uh, a Kid in there. Get a Marlowe, of course, in there. You know, because yeah. these plays rank right there in any by, by any critical judgment. Um, <clears throat> and you know, going back a bit to Green. Uh, even though you don't track his influence so much in Shakespeare, you are arguing that there is that there's this competitiveness and that Shakespeare is learning from all of these people. There's this um, uh, I don't want to call it an echo chamber. There, there's a lot of noise in there. There are a lot of things going around. And these people, it almost depresses me when I think about how pro prodigious their memories were. And oh, I, yeah. I've yeah. never, I've never experienced that kind of thing. And I talked with Peter Holland about memory and, you know, too much memory is a bad thing. Uh, it's another, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but these guys, it, they were just like, I mean, magnets, they just drew in and they kept these things in there. And of course the actors had to do the same thing too. Uh, and here they are drawing from classical sources, Seneca, while at the same time doing these absurdly innovative things in the English language and with dramatic structure that that, that seem, we don't know, there's so much lost out there, that seemed very unprecedented. It just seemed to blow up uh, at one point. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very interesting with Robert Greene because... As, as as I've discovered, he was he was hugely influential on on other playwrights and on uh, rival companies. Shakespeare, when you compare his 
his engagement with Green to his engagement with the likes of plays of George Peel, Christopher Marlowe, Thomas Kidd, there's actually very little evidence of Shakespeare attending particularly closely to Robert Greene's dramatic language, which I, I think is quite ironic, given that you've got this discourse of plagiarism surrounding the, the Grotesworth of uh, Wits pamphlet, which I, I, I don't agree with. I, I don't think that Green or Henry Shettle, you know, whoever was responsible for this, I, I don't think their umbrage pertains to you know, plagiarism or revisionism, you know, going back to that Edmund Lone theory that Shakespeare's Henry VI plays were essentially just, Henry VI part two and three were just adaptations of works by Green and, and Peel and so forth. I think with Green, he's a little bit unsettled as a university educated dramatist that you've got a, a, an actor on the scene who's who's able to, to appropriate the sort of stylistic flourishes of his contemporaries and that bombastic language, uh, particularly in Henry VI Part Three, which which Green uh, uh, directly references, and you know these actors who who uh, beautified in the feathers of dramatists because they're delivering their dramatic dialogue on stage. Suddenly, they're they're producing their own works, uh, and and you know they're they're doing innovative things. They're playing around with stylistic registers. They're, they're seeking to better uh, the plays in which they performed. So for me, it very much comes down to Shakespeare as a player, uh, Shakespeare's background as an, as an actor. And it, it ties in, I think, with Green's general combated, uh, combativeness uh, with, with actors uh, performing uh, at, at the time in general. I, I don't think it's an accusation of plagiarism but I, I do find it quite ironic that there's actually very little evidence of Shakespeare plagiarizing you know, Green's dramatic language. I, I think Green's influence on, on Shakespeare was a bit more subtle to that. I think Green very much assists, for example, with the development of Seneca on the English commercial stage. So we often think of Green as, as a, a comic writer or, or, or a writer of romances. Uh, I argue that towards the end of his career, he was actually chiefly engaged when it comes to drama in writing tragedies. Uh -huh. So there's there's the influence of Green, but it's not a it's not a direct influence. It's a case of Green having such an important position when it comes to the development of drama, to the development of the public theatres. That without Green, I, I think Shakespeare's plays would read very differently. So I, I think it's a, it's a positive impact that Green had on Shakespeare. Whereas, as I, as I mentioned earlier, it's often framed in malignant terms when we're thinking of that relationship. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I'm just thinking about so much now. But uh, the uh, the the thing about well, Kidd and Shakespeare. There's no evidence that Kidd went to university. No. Uh, and I'm I'm getting that most recently from you. Uh, there is uh, uh, great evidence that Green was uh, exquisitely well educated, both at Cambridge and at Oxford. Mm -hmm. And you know the argument is sometimes made that uh, you know how could someone not a, a non-university guy write Shakespeare? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it, you're you almost are saying that it may have impeded Green a bit. He had to he had to bring it down. Because you have to, you know, Mar uh, Shakespeare and Kidd seem to have an instinctive way to connect with people through language, through uh, stagecraft, whatever, uh, through their selection of narratives and mm -hmm. just an instinctive knowledge that uh, got in the way of an earlier playwright, Stephen Goss, a fa failed Stephen Gosson, I think of, you know, which, who complains about how these guys are just ransacking, I think is the word he uses, ransacking the, um, pl you know, the these books and uh, filling the playhouses of London with all this stuff. You know, there's, they're just thieves and uh, commoners and whatnot. And for my students, I wanted uh, to make the point that when you one way to get a title was to get a university education that marked you, Christopher Marlowe, gentleman, you had that basic status um, and it would be hard on a guy who was so well educated to come in and begin competing with people like uh, an upstart crow and yeah. and also kid who are just yeah. uh, a kid in particular, just killing it. And uh, he, he's trying to, you know, stay with them. 
And he goes, you know, I should be better. I should be better than these guys. Maybe, you know, that's highly speculative, but you can see that dynamic at work. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm a gentleman, you know, uh, these guys don't have the same rank, you know? So, yeah. 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 And, and, you know, author names seldom mentioned on, on play title pages during the period, but, but Green's name actually is. So he's, he's far more marketable and saleable than, often given credit, I think. And, you know, you get that emphasis on on gent, gentleman, on that sense of his education. I, I was thinking of a, a line from the, uh, I think it's the return to Parnassus, which is few university men pen plays well, which of course, you know, is is certainly not the case. But I, I think you, you see a, a significant stylistic contrast between kids, Shakespeare, and university educated playwrights like Green, Marlowe, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, you know, thinking of the use of classical allusions, for instance, the, the plays of university educated dramatists are often satiated with classical allusions. Green, despite his education, often jumbles his his mythology, <laughs> actually. Yeah, okay. Whereas you, you get the sense with Shakespeare in particular that he's he's very conscious of his audience. Again, I think it comes yeah. down to his background as an actor and not not alienating the audience and one of the discoveries I, I made while writing my book Shakespeare's Tutor was that a lot of university educated dramatists stick to the 10 syllable line mm -hmm. you know uh dum de dum de dum de dum whereas Shakespeare is is very innovative right from the bat as soon as he starts his dramatic writing career in terms of incorporating that extra 11th unstressed syllable the so-called feminine ending which is a very very sexist term um but but we kind of have to to make do with that so i think shakespeare right from the beginning of his career recognizes the the need for some linguistic flexibility and what i found was that the only other dramatist who reaches uh, a comparable rate to shakespeare is thomas kidd so i think that's very interesting that you know you, you've got two non-university educated playwrights there with with some stylistic similarities you also see it in the ways in which they put words together uh so-called compound forms so kid kid delights in putting words together like flax and heads and uh, a particular favorite of mine occurs in solomon and Poseidon, pinky eyed and this is something that's long been attributed to Shakespeare, who he delights in compounding words. Well, well, Kidd was doing it, you know, before Shakespeare actually came on the scene. So lots of synergies there. And I also think Kidd is a lot more proficient when it comes to rhetoric than a lot of the university educated dramatists of the period. And, and Shakespeare, of course, a real master of, of revealing his rhetorical training that he would have received at grammar school on the stage. I, I think Shakespeare really recognizes the, the potentialities that lie behind using particular rhetorical devices. And I think we see that in, in Thomas Kidd as well. He's, he's often dismissed unfairly, Thomas Kidd, as being a, a bombastic writer. But, but even if you look at the Spanish tragedy, almost certainly his, his earlier surviving work, you, you've actually got a play that's, you know, going up and down different linguistic registers and, and reveling in prose and it's incredibly fluid and you get a sense of individuality with his characters, which is something Shakespeare uh, also reveals in, in his plays. These dramatists' characters weren't just functional. You know, they, they weren't just types in the way that we might think of some of George Peel's characters, for instance. So, yeah, I, I feel that maybe the fact that Shakespeare and Kidd lacked uh, a university education, uh, it, it seems to have helped them in many respects. It, it seems to have it really aided them when it comes to engaging theatre that, that's not going to put off audiences. It's not just a case of showing off your learning. It's a case of being efficient you yeah. know, with these particular stylistic tropes and conventions that you're playing with. Yeah, yeah. Um, we could go on forever. One thing that I'm finding in uh, the way you approach this is uh, the emphasis on 
the <clears throat> the actor, the spoken line and the actor. And I know you've done acting and I wanted to move a little bit into some of the other things that you do uh, beyond uh, very stringent <laughs> research of, uh, you know, uh, title pages and uh, excerpts from here and there and references to uh, make uh, make your case, but you've done that. You've written fiction. Could we go and look into that element? Uh, because I think you're bringing that experience also into your perspectives uh, in terms of your criticism. Yeah, I guess that ties into what I was saying about Shakespeare and Kid try not to alienate their audiences. And so, so I've got a background in creative writing, so writing for a more general reader. So what I try to do is bring these very complex topics, uh, such as you know, textual scholarship, uh, corpus linguistics and so forth, and, and, and try and make them accessible for, for broader audiences. So I've always written, uh, I've always enjoyed creative writing. I actually wrote a, a parodic trilogy um, of, of uh, novellas uh, about Christopher Marlowe, which, which kind of, yeah. <laughs> you know, combines the likes of Zorro, the Three Musketeers, James Bond, and and, and Christopher Marlowe. <laughs> this is not my magnum opus, but it, it was it was it was it was great fun. Um, and I've also al always really enjoyed writing poetry. So I've, I've got a poetry collection uh, forthcoming next year, and that was so right. wonderful to to return to poetry because. I hadn't written anything for for several years, and you know something just you know, sparked that uh, that desire to write poetry again. Yeah. Maybe it was yeah. because I started listening to Bruce Springsteen yeah. uh, du du during my uh, my drives back and forth uh, to, between Stratford and and, and Cardiff. <laughs> so it was so wonderful to to return to poetry and. You know, telling stories that that's all that's always been something I've I've always uh, thoroughly enjoyed, and, and I've always enjoyed acting as well. Um, uh, it, it comes back to memories, I, I think. I've I've had some tremendous memories coming to Stratford upon Avon from Wales, in the UK. You know, you're essentially like a kid in a sweet shop there. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're a Shakespeare lover and you're looking around you and you're seeing. Othello taxi. You're, you're seeing a cafe called the Food of Love. Uh, you go into a, a a chip shop, and you know I have to admit that I've eaten a kebab called the Shakespeare Special purely mm -hmm. because it had Shakespeare in the title. Uh, and I always remember in in 2018 uh, coming to Stratford, starting as as a lecturer at the Trust, and uh, very swiftly having to learn all of Leonardo's lines in Much Ado About Nothing. So I was mm -hmm. asked to perform uh, outdoors uh, in, a, in a production of that play. And you know, Leonardo has quite a lot of lines. And it was quite miraculous. I kind of had them down. And the performance happened to occur on the day of the, the Stratford Festival. So this little market town was just a buzz with, with like thousands upon thousands of people, fireworks going off, uh, music blasting. And here we are performing on the outdoor uh, uh, RSE Dell stage. And, you know, I, I thought, I've got this. I've got, I've got all these lines down. I'm thinking of Shakespeare's capacious actorly memory. I remember looking up and just seeing probably the biggest audience I've ever <laughs> perform to and of course Leonardo has the very first line of the play I learn in this letter that Don Pedro of Aragon comes this night to Messina and so I just strode onto the stage and said I learn in this letter that Don Pedro of Messina comes this night to Messina so I, I had messed up <laughs> the very first line of the play it's this is a joyous occasion I'm standing there looking like I've gotten upside down hanger in my mouth <laughs> smiling away and in my head i'm thinking if i mess up the next line I, i'm gonna have to just <laughs> stop this and we go again uh but fortunately it, you know it, it went really well um but you learn so much from performing shakespeare i, I think so you know when it comes to uh, authorship attribution studies for instance th th there's been an argument that shakespeare must have been the author of parts of Ardner Favisham, for instance, which has uh -huh. been attributed to Thomas Kidd since 1891, mm -hmm. because he wouldn't have been on the stage for 
you know, these different scenes which have entirely different characters. So the, the indication there is that Shakespeare would only remember the lines that he delivered on stage. Uh, and I know from, from an actor perspective that when a production ends, the lines that often stay with me, they're not necessarily the ones I delivered. There's just certain lines that seem to, to prick the ear, to capture the imagination. So I think it's really useful to, to bring that perspective to it and, you know, put flesh on these textual bones. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, particularly when you're reading uh, these people. Uh, Green, I think in particular, you were talking about uh, reading um, the reading out loud. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you get a sense uh, of, of what they're trying to do. And particularly when you can get an actor uh, to do it, uh, you go, oh, Oh, that's that's where that's where we're coming from. You know, it's, it's so you could argue this with Shakespeare, too. But uh, I, I guess we know we already know with Shakespeare. But these are other more marginal to most of us outside of these uh, uh, smaller circles we're in. Uh, yeah. Read it out loud. And and uh, these uh, bombastic speeches, there's a lot more going on there. Uh, yeah. There surely is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You mentioned your affiliation with the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, and I thought we were going to lead with that, but I was just so interested in what you had just gotten out, <laughs> and I had this in my head. I didn't want to lose, uh, you know, what I um, was reading yesterday and the day before and the day before, uh, mm -hmm. but I do think that there are a number of our listeners and, watch and viewers who uh, are not as familiar with the educational programs. They may have heard of, they may have gone to Stratford, they know of the the trust. I um, in, I spoke with um, uh, uh, Lena Orland, who's uh, I believe on uh, serves in a capacity on the uh, board, or in, uh, in and um, I want to know a little bit more about the programs. I know there's a lot of uh, uh, educational, uh, there are educational programs from childhood all the way up to university, that kind of thing. But uh, your role in the birthplace trust and and what types of things that you get involved with there. And mm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's It really is a, a, a role of infinite variety. Um, you know, like I mentioned, if you're a Shakespeare lover, just coming to Stratford upon Avon and, and working there, an absolute joy. But but working for the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust comes back to memories again. I have made the most incredible memories. So my role is lecture in Shakespeare studies. So part part of my role is to develop relationships with organizations around the world. So domestically in the United Kingdom, but with with a particular emphasis on organizations in the USA. So mm -hmm. I often attend conferences. Um, I've gone on lecture tours very early in, in my days of working at the Trust. I, I traveled to the States and visited, uh, I think it was five states in nine days and gave something like 14 talks. Um, and that was to you know high school students and, and also uh, leisure learners as well. Uh, I'm also thinking of digital humanities, uh, deeply involved in in the trust digital output. So, for instance, I, I project manage a, a course called Self-Led Macbeth, uh, which is very much pitched at teachers who want to broaden their understanding of the play, or, or even if they're just looking for a refresher before going into uh, high school teaching. And I lecture online, uh, uh, often from my home in Cardiff, so there's a real emphasis on on digital pedagogy at the trust, but I also lecture in person, and I, I tend to lecture from about the age of sixteen to seventeen upwards. So mm -hmm. lecture to teenagers, uh, lecture to college students, lecture to university students, lecture to leisure learners. Um, so you're know, thinking about the whole the whole pathway there. And as you mentioned, uh, the educational team, the learning team at the trust start very young and, yeah. and you know, go, go throughout life's journey, really. And when I think of audience, uh, that's something I, I really love about this job in particular, because sometimes, you know, I lecture to much younger audiences. And I always remember uh, 
within the first couple of years of, of working at the trust that I gave a, a talk on Shakespeare's life and times to a very young audience. They must have been about seven or eight years old. And then immediately afterwards, I walked into another lecture theatre and had to deliver a lecture to the Norwegian Shakespeare Society. So, you know, really going up and down the gears in, in terms of pitch, in terms of, you know, audience comprehension. I love that. I love engaging with as broad an audience as possible and on so many different topics because, you know, a lecture in Shakespeare studies, well, that covers an awful lot, of course. Uh, yeah. And, you know, you, you, you're speaking about all of these different plays or or such topics as Shakespeare and gender, uh, for instance, uh, Shakespeare's history plays, when you, you think you're thinking generically. And, you know, sometimes we give pre-performance talks um, for, for audiences visiting from around the world uh, uh, and going to see a production at the Royal Shakespeare Company. So a few years ago, I, I joked that I was probably one of the world's leading experts on the restoration dramatist Thomas Otway, because I was teaching his play Venice Preserves uh, yeah. uh, and, and, you know, really had to imbibe all of that information. So, you know, we, we lecture to, to groups in the United Kingdom, but we also get an awful lot of international groups who, who yeah. come to Stratford-upon-Avon uh, for a week or two, or some groups actually sort of come back and forth to us sporadically over the period of several months. And it's just, it's just incredible. It's a real privilege for me, watching these students and how they develop their confidence, how they broaden their knowledge as, as these courses progress and engaging with different voices. I, I think that's the key thing. They, they get to hear different voices in that setting of Shakespeare's hometown of Stratford-upon-Avon. And the Trust also offers workshops, for instance, as well, which, which give give audiences uh, opportunities to engage with Shakespeare's language in, in quite different ways to really put these things on their feet. It becomes a form yeah. of practical criticism, I think. So, yeah, it, yeah it's, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful role. And uh, I, I would hope that what the Trust has to offer in terms of education, that will become more widespread in, in, in terms of people knowing that, that, that we're doing this this work. And we have been doing this work for, for many years. And if you come to Stratford for an even and partake in, in one of our talks or, or one of our courses, I think you'd be making memories for life, really. Uh, I, I know I certainly have as, as a lecturer. Well, all right. Let's let's talk about that. Let's say someone wants to visit Stratford and maybe spend a couple of days there and uh, take in some plays uh, and uh, want to participate uh, or, or or sit in for a lecture. Or do you just walk into the door and uh, write your name down, or is there a kind of you know? <laughs> uh, no, no. Unfortunately, on an individual basis, but the the, the trust also offers. Uh, leisure learner courses uh -huh. uh, so at the moment the, there's there's five courses uh over the, the period of this year 2023 uh, revolving in large part around different aspects of the first folio but also focusing on on various plays you know, from julius caesar to cymbeline to macbeth merchant of venice as you like it for instance so there, there are frequent opportunities over the course of a year for uh, individuals to, to partake. And it becomes this wonderful community. It's really lovely because some of the people who take part in these leisure learner courses have, have been doing so you know, before I was born. Uh, yeah. But you also often have people come in for the first time and you know, they're offering new voices. It, it's very much uh, discursive. It, it's all about you know, communicating, having conversations about Shakespeare. So there's there's plenty of opportunities for for individuals to 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 join these courses. I think uh, if you ch check out the uh, Shakespeare Birthplace Trust website, shakespeare.org.uk, yeah. yeah. you, you'll see a, a great deal of opportunities. Yeah. I really would encourage people to to partake. Uh, yeah, and you know, of course, not, that's try try not to just walk on. Um, walk in, but the um, I, I saw that there's an, uh, a, just an enormous number of offerings uh, coming from the trust, 
um, and so forth. And uh, it, this reminds me so much. I'm just so sentimental about this. I'm sentimental about the 19th century and maybe ways that other people aren't. But the Hazlitt, uh, the Surrey lectures, uh, Hazlitt did where he's filling rooms up with uh, working class people who, after this hard, you know, hard shift, are coming in to listen to him speak on Shakespeare. And then the stories of, uh, uh, was it Edward Dowden uh, filling up the uh, Trinity Halls in uh, Dublin and people lifting up their friends so they could look in the window because the auditorium's full, you know, the uh, I see this kind of enterprise coming on, you know, where you're connecting with these people who are just hungry for Shakespeare. Uh, I, I run across uh, people, you know, friends of mine from high school and so forth. And it's kind of like, oh, you know, a lot of eye rolling when you say you're Shakespearean or you're working with Shakespeare. There's a lot of that. But I think these people don't understand that however small the group is, it's a lot of people, however small the percentage is. Okay. It's a lot of people. Like you say, the streets are full of people in Stratford upon Avon, uh, Avon when you're uh, at certain times of year. And it's uh, not these shopping tourists. They're there for Shakespeare. And uh, whatever small percentage is, it is, it's a lot of people. And yeah. th this public outreach is just absolutely what uh, what is needed to argue not just for Shakespeare or for any of these other playwrights for the uh, public humanities, uh, yeah. which you know just have been under assault for uh, now uh, several decades uh, uh, against you know various uh, I I don't know utilitarian voices you know that goes back to the 19th century too, yeah you you need roads roads and bridges but. Uh, Golly gee, a lot of people want this. And when you give it to them, you, it's just surprising how infectious it is and how many people, how so many people, when they realize, oh, I can participate, I can understand. They uh, just, well, I think that was probably us, uh, as you know, younger versions of us. You know, mm -hmm. we probably were pushed in one direction. I know I was, and I just kept coming back to this. Um yeah. And the trust seems to be doing that type of work, and it's such good work. I know we talk about it a lot with other speakers on this uh, series, uh, that uh, outreach is a very, very important thing and letting people know that, uh, hey, we're just regular guys. You know, uh, no yeah. no ascots and pipes here. Nobody's going to look down on you. My goodness, you know, it's, it's a hard road for us, yeah. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. Um, that's very good. Well, now, what can we expect coming up here in your scholarship and the work that you're doing? What do you what do you see in the next two or three years? So at the moment, I'm working on a third book, uh, which is is titled Shakespeare's Borrowed Feathers. So that's very much aiming to to bring this sort of discourse revolving around authorship and, and different methods to to a, a much wider audience. So it, it's a book that focuses on the ways in which Shakespeare was influenced by the dramas of his fellow playwrights. So I begin with John Lilly and I conclude with John Fletcher. So we're, we're going you know, throughout uh, Shakespeare's dramatic writing career and, and using online databases and, and cutting edge digital technologies uh, in order to offer a more methodical approach, I think, when it comes to understanding how Shakespeare was influenced by, imitated and adapted the works of other playwrights. So that's been quite a, a fascinating project where the, the results often tend to, to validate and extend you know, existing scholarly hypotheses, uh -huh. uh, but also challenge prior assumptions as well. So yeah. I'm very much arguing for early one drama as, as, as being a, a community of playwrights, you know, there's a, there's a lot of scholarship on the ways in which Shakespeare influenced other dramatists, but I, I just want to offer a new perspective on the ways in which Shakespeare attended closely to the plays of of other writers of the period. Uh, so yeah, fingers crossed uh, that that will be that will be out in the next year or two. Um, sort of at the tail end of the uh, initial manuscript at the moment but it, it's, it's just been wonderful and I think it, it's great 
it's a learning journey, isn't it? It's great to broaden your own knowledge. And, and yeah. you know, I, I was really keen to learn more about the likes of John Lilly and Thomas Decker, for instance, and Ben Johnson's fascinating relationship with Shakespeare. So so charting Shakespeare's entire dramatic writing career, it, it's I've learned a great deal from it. And I hope that, you know, readers uh, can, can get a lot of knowledge and enjoyment from it as well. Yeah, they should. And I love the idea that you see it as a composite, a period that is a a, 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 a composite of many voices, of many people, you know, where, you know, the, it, who built that cathedral? Well, a mm. lot of people did. A lot of people, yeah. you know, the guys carried the stones. There was a whole process there. There were there were guys swinging hammers down at the theater, building scaffolding for plays, you know, all the way up to whatever your featured uh, actor and uh, uh, whatever given play. Uh, I did want to uh, mention a bit that you you do mention. I, I've done work on lost plays with David McGinnis and his oh, database, yeah. and uh, uh, the work that uh, Rosalind Nutson did, uh, of course, uh, from some years ago and and now. And also, you mentioned Martin Wiggins. Uh, mm. In terms of digital humanities, if I, my focus would be more, much more on databases and having the, all of that information and in, uh, the multi-volume set that uh, Wiggins has put out is brilliant research. You yeah. look in there and you go, this is just, there's just so much here that connects. Yeah. And I would love to see somewhere down the road, a digitized version of that kind of information where you can collaborate this idea with that idea where you can do a, a search for any, you know, whatever we're looking for, which is just a, just a multitude of things uh, mm -hmm. because page by page, volume by volume, uh, you do have to have a prodigious memory to, to yeah. bring it in, but you, there's so much there, even without the play. <laughs> It's just wow. amazing when you look at that composite and then working it into a, a period where these plays did survive, or at least uh, some of you know, a percentage of them did. Wow. Uh, so I love it. So you think you're, you'll be starting more or less in the 80s and moving out through through maybe the first uh, couple of decades, three maybe of the 17th century? Oh, yeah. Start, starting off in the 80s, 80s. 1580s yeah. with, with, with John Lilly and uh, ending, you know, around 1612. 1613 um 1613 okay i was thinking shakespeare's sort yeah. of uh retirement i mean it, it's been it's been really fascinating but particularly learning more about lily because what i've discovered with lily's dramatic language that shakespeare doesn't appear to have attended particularly closely to it in the early mm -hmm. stages of his career of course we see elements of lily's dramaturgy particularly in shakespeare's comedies but as Shakespeare starts writing plays for the, the Blackfriars Theatre, that's when you suddenly get this engagement with John Lilly's dramatic language. Yeah. And of course, you know, some of Lilly's plays had been performed at that site previously. So for me, that gives you a, a real insight into Shakespeare as an author coming towards the end of his career. But he's, he's looking into the past again for inspiration because he's yeah. deeply conscious of his, his Blackfriars audience. I think so that that's yeah. just one sort of insight into to the sort of discoveries I've made with this book. I, I think the key thing is that Shakespeare really emerges as, as a man of the theater in yeah. this book. And, and that, that's, that's very much how I see him. Uh, I don't think Shakespeare ever, you know, neglected the, the actorly sides of, of his career. And, you know, we know that he was acting at least uh, until at least, you know, 1603 in, in Ben Johnson's The Janus. But the first folio tells us that he he acted in all of his plays ostensibly. So yeah. that goes hand in hand for Shakespeare, I think. He, he's not just a dramatist. He, he's also an actor. He's also a shareholder in yeah. the theatres. He is a man who is deeply cognizant of the strengths and limitations of the stage and his audiences. Yeah, and he outlived uh, at least by uh, he didn't he didn't die as an old man by any means, but he outlived these contemporaries of his. Uh, the uh, uh, one kind of maybe going toward closing uh, this notion of Lily. There seems to be a lot there that would have to be considered uh, with the. It's not a diametric opposition, but you have uh, children's companies 
that yeah. are uh, strongly used all the, you know, and Johnson, you know, with Lily all the way through, you know, they mm. they kind of, they kind of um, go out for a period and then come back. Uh, yeah. And at one point I studied that, but I've forgotten it, the precise uh, times uh, and uh, Shakespeare, of course, I was just gathering this from Hamlet, I guess, mainly that was on the side of the full, you know, age range in an acting company, including uh, children or boys. And yeah. so the, that to me would be a very complex thing because you think of uh, the more gentrified theater with the boys productions, perhaps, and then with the uh, wider range, age range, the more popular, the globe type theater uh, that brings in a whole huge element of consideration of how oh yeah you engage yeah, with your that, audience yeah that, that that's been that's been a wonderful uh thing to learn more about i think those, those boy actors were clapped tyrannically and and also it was part of the book looking at the ways in which the language of of the court and the language of plays performed by the children's company seep into the language of of the public theaters when of course we know that writers such as marlowe uh, and, and George Peel were, were also writing for these children's companies. Just thinking of the yeah. Elizabethan period uh, yeah. before you get to the likes of Johnson, for instance. So, so yeah, there's there's a, a great deal to to think about. Uh, but it, it, it's truly fascinating. And then thinking about Shakespeare's relationship with those companies, sort of beyond that uh, most famous instance in, in Hamlet, of course. Yeah, well, and, and there's a ton more stuff that we could talk about. Uh, Darren, I have kept you through your morning. I'm, uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm getting, um, it's getting sort of late here in Tokyo. And um, I, I hear um, uh, bells going off at home where uh, there may, there, there, there may be a, uh, a meal waiting for me uh, if I'm lucky. Uh, or I, may, I may be told to cook my own. I'm not sure. Uh, the, uh, the thing is, it's wonderful. Now, uh, I, I don't want to uh, probe too much into your private life, but you did mention that you have your home is in Cardiff, actually. Yeah. And you you do a, a good bit of commuting. And my memory is uh, you're on. Yeah, that's that's a good that's a good uh, hop there to uh, start. Oh, two hour drive. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's about a two hour drive. A two so. hour yeah, which is not which is not too. That's bad. not bad. Why was I thinking Cardiff? Uh, I'm thinking is it the M4 that connects with London yes. from Cardiff? But you yeah. shoot up, so you're yeah. you're not you don't hit the um, M25 going around. No. that turns into a parking lot from the time from time to time. If my <laughs> memory <laughs> if my memory serves, uh, I'm, there's a great deal of luck in it, of course. But yes, usually the M4 and. Um, uh, I thought it was a lot uh, further. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, it's not. So, it's not. It's not too bad. So you 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 could do it in a day, back back and forth again, and uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's always lovely to arrive in oh. uh, Stratford. It it never gets old. See yeah. that beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful well, I, I have done. I I came <laughs> out of the, the the kind of uh I, I I commuted. Oh my, those are horrible memories in the last century when I was just out of graduate school. But the, those uh, the, when your, your destination is Stratford and then on the back end, Cardiff, a bit, you know, a perfectly beautiful place. Uh, are you are you Welsh by any uh, chance? Oh, yes. Yeah, yes, I was the, the uh, hyphenated name. I'm thinking uh, gave away uh, the, the uh, name. Uh, 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 I uh, had for uh, some years a friend in Pembrokeshire and would uh, uh, go yeah. uh, visit him. This is we're going back 10 years now, but I, I had the chance to visit him four or five times. Uh, and I just always just absolutely adored driving through Wales, any any place that I can find it, um, yeah. because uh, the north is gorgeous. Uh, the south is to Pembrokeshire. It's just wonderful. And I. Uh, uh, that my I have uh, on my mother's side a family name Reese R E E S, ah, which yes. is my son's name and my older brother's name and so forth. And I remember going to an old church and there was a, uh, a marker there, an old old marker with R E E S, you know, spelled that way ah. as it is in my family. So I guess we have some sort of genetic connection there. You you feel I it? Maybe. <laughs> uh, We're related. I'm, beyond, I'm beyond very pro. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm very pro Wales. <laughs> very pro Wales. Uh, and I pull 
I don't know if I should say this, but I, you know, the Six Nations, I, I tend to, you know, feel have strong feelings for the Welsh team. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Feelings of disappointment in recent years, but uh, well, they'll, they'll, you they'll know, back. <laughs> it goes in waves. I remember stopping, and I thought, you know, we were uh, about. I was getting tired. Uh, we'd driven. And I stopped about an hour and a half away from where my friend lived. And I said, let's just go up to here and have a pub. I think we're allowed a pint, you know, and I, I'm still good to uh, finish the drive, you know, and just take a little break. And we were stopped on the street in this little village by this guy who saw my wife and me as tourists. And uh, he said, OK, now you just must know that we have this town has provided two of the players on the Welsh national rugby team. And he wow. was very proud of that. And we had to know that before we were allowed to, into the pub. And we were uh, oh, uh, oh, great, graciously yeah. received. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. it's, it's just such an intrinsic part of the culture here. And I, yeah, I'm steeped in rugby, uh, yeah, you know, right from the course. beginning of my life. It's, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, what what are my foremost passions in life rugby i think <laughs> yeah yeah well as it should be i mean uh, it's in your blood and it uh, is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh darren i cannot uh, uh express how uh grateful we are you know for your time here because you know as we picked up in this conversation. You're a busy guy, and uh, to, to take the time to speak to us on this little uh, series here is just wonderful. If I could ask you to stay a little bit after we record, uh, yeah. uh, we can debrief just a bit. But uh, for our listeners and also for our viewers, thank you so much, and we just wish you the very best in your efforts, uh, both uh, you know with family in Cardiff and there in Stratford upon Avon. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you.